Hello, I'm Michael Burke. Welcome to a brand new series of Royal Recipes. This time, we're at Western Burt House, formerly a grand country house, now a boarding school, which has played host to royal visitors for over a hundred years. In this series, we're delving even further back in time to reveal over 600 years of royal food heritage. You play Anne Boleyn, <laughs> and I will play Henry VIII. And we've been busy unlocking the secrets of Britain's great food archives, discovering rare and unseen recipes that have been royal favourites through the ages. From the earliest royal cookbook in 1390... It's so precious, so special, that I'm not allowed to touch it. ..to Tudor treats from the court of Henry VIII. I can't wait for this. <laughs> One, two, three. We'll be exploring the great culinary traditions enjoyed by the royal family, from the grand to the groundbreaking, as well as the surprisingly simple. I did think that was going to be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> as we hear from a host of royal chefs. Prince Philip would walk past or pop his head in and say, what's for dinner, what are we having? Yeah, oh, yeah, it's not just a normal kitchen. And meet the people who provide for the royal table. It's OK for the Queen, it's OK for everyone. Welcome to Royal Recipes. In today's programme, we're going to be looking at the food that's served up when a royal personage pays a call, whether that's a British royal dropping in or a full-blown state visit from foreign royalty. This time on Royal Recipes, Chef Paul Ainsworth has aspirations for his souffle. Middle shelf be fine, Michael. They're going to rise that high. I don't want them to touch the top. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be riding the rails in royal style. This is just incredible. It's fabulous, isn't it? And putting a modern spin on a banquet thrown for a Persian potentate. Ready? Yep. Way! Oh, yeah. I'm here in the Royal Recipes kitchen with Michelin-starred chef Paul Ainsworth. What are you cooking now? A very luxurious dish today, Michael. Lobster souffle. Oh, now that <laughs> yes. is a really right <laughs> royal dish, isn't it? That and is. And it's one cooked by Prince William, you know, three months after they were married. Their first royal tour together, they went to Canada. Uh, and in Quebec, they went to a cookery school and he had to do this dish. High right. wrist dish. Yeah. And he pulled it off, which was quite did a shock. Did he pull it off, did he? He did. Good on. The pressure's on me today. <laughs> well, it's a risky dish, isn't it? It's about the flavour of it. Sometimes it can get all hung up on the rise and the height. As long as it tastes nice, that's the most important thing. What? And what we've got in here is yeah. butter. And now we're going to add in our flour. And we just basically want to bring that together to just gently, don't let it catch, and then just the butter and the flour basically work together like so. Here we have our lobster bisque. Mm -hmm. We're just going to add a little bit at a time. So you're just basically working it in. Don't just, don't just add it all in at once. You've got quite a paste there, really. And that's what it's going to be. This is basically like the body of our souffle. It's such a lovely, rich colour, isn't it? Yeah. Right, OK. Do you do souffles a lot in your restaurant? No, we don't. I won't say it's something that I'm a massive fan of, but I appreciate why people love them. It's a theatre, mm. isn't it? It is, yeah. OK, so now we have our velouté, OK? Very thick. We're just going to add to that some parmesan. So that's going to give it a real flavour. Real, isn't real kick. Now, Michael, if I could ask you, please, can you whisk up those egg whites there, right next These to These here? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Here we go. Just soft peaks, all right? Yep. They'll, they'll, they'll whisk up real quickly. I appreciate your trust in me, Paul. Yes, no, of course. Misplaced, possibly. <laughs> Misplaced, yeah. How are you getting on? All right. Fantastic. Well, brilliant. It's going to take off in a minute. Yeah. Keep going, yeah. So you're just kind of getting like a soft peak. That's it. Fabulous. OK, turn it off. Turn it off? Yeah. Brilliant. Off all the way. That's it. Give it a little. That's it. Hang on. Was I brilliant? You were. You were absolutely phenomenal. Can I have a job? Phenomenal. I'll be looking for uh, one after this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any day of the week. And now this is the important bit. Okay. Yeah. Just be really gentle. 
because you don't want to knock the air out. So I'm just checking what we call a folding technique. Yeah. That's what's going to help the mix rise. The bloke who really made souffle the, you know, the glamorous luxury dish was a guy called Marie-Antoine Kerem, who was chef to Prince Regent. The Prince yes. Regent, later George the Fourth. So yeah. while I'm just doing this, Michael, yeah. over there are my moulds, OK? Yeah. Now, what I've done is I've buttered them once, yeah. put them in the fridge, let the butter set, yeah. then take them out, butter them again, and put them in the fridge again. Why now, do you what do you're that? Doing, you're basically creating, like, a double skin on the side, so the souffle will be absolutely kind of... When it's in there, it will just slide nicely yeah. up as it's, as it's rising. You don't want it to catch on the sides? No. Right, here you go. Yeah. We're almost here, OK? Right, so if we just bring this one over. our souffles closer, yeah. yeah. Gosh, that's really okay, smooth, isn't it? And a lovely, slide, lovely so. colour. Now, before you go all the way, we're just going to tap. Yeah. And the reason, so there's no air pockets in the middle, it would result in it collapsing. Yeah. OK? So, again, another little tap like that, or on the bottom, OK? Have you ever had this really fail? Not rise, collapse? All Generally, the time. Really? Generally, on, when you do it on telly. <laughs> 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 so, with our mix, we're going to do here, Michael. Ready? Yeah. Going to skim off the top. Skim off the top, like so. Okay. Have to tidy up the sides. Tidy up the sides. And then Don't we've got waste one it. Don't last waste it. Little tip with souffle. Okay. Right. See how you've got the mix on the side there? Yeah. Okay. Just with your thumb, mm -hmm. go all the way around like so. Why are you doing that then? I'll show you right now. Now, you see how the mix has come off the side? Yeah. And when it rises, you'll yeah. have a lovely little lip going right the way along the side. So that's another way of Absolutely. making sure it doesn't catch. Doesn't catch, yeah. One last tap, yeah. like that, OK? Now, those in the oven, 200, so a nice hot oven, hot OK? Oven, yeah. For about 12 minutes. 12 okay? minutes. OK, here it goes. Middle shelf be fine, Michael. They're going to rise that high. I don't want them to touch the top. <laughs> he says, he says. <laughs> right, so next, what next, we've got our lobsters. Claws, the knuckles yeah. and the tail. Yeah. I've cooked the tail for two minutes yeah. in boiling water. The claws, three minutes, and then we just take the meat, OK? So we're just going to take some lobster, Michael, like so, and we're just going to cut it into small pieces. Oh. All right? Like that. Thank you. Absolutely. You're a gent. De absolutely delicious. Mm. Just so tender, isn't it? Mm. We're going to take a little bit of knuckle, like so, OK? Mm -hmm. And a lovely bit of that tail as well. And then what will happen, Michael, is the sauce that we cook it in is just going to then warm it back through and make it even more tender. So in here, we're going to take some of that lovely lobster bisque sauce, yep. OK? And then like you're straining so, it. Yep. Straining it. Yeah. And that is the shells, the tomatoes, everything in there. Even the head, everything is what's giving it, it's thickening it, OK? I mean, can you actually okay. see Prince William doing all this? I can't. Or maybe you've got a bit of help. Yeah. OK, so what happens now? Right. We're going to get some chives mm -hmm. and we're going to get some butter. We're just going to bring that up to a simmer. We're just going to drop our chives. Lobster, chive, Combination onion, made though. in heaven. Oh, though. fantastic. Like so. Okay. Right, i going to add in a little bit of our butter now into our sauce. It'll give it a bit more body and a real luxuriousness. And while mm. we're waiting, we're just going to grab a lemon. Like so. Butter and lemon and everything, always. Yes, yeah, always. It? Always trying to get that acidity coming from somewhere. So the butter, Michael's just emulsifying in there beautifully. Little tip as well, just make sure the butter's cold when you're whisking it into a sauce. Dice Why? it up, emulsifies in much nicer. You don't get that greasy film. All right, so we're just going to have a taste. Beautiful. And you can smell the lobster. Right, just have a taste of that I now. will, I will, okay. I will. All right. Give me a spoon. OK. Here we go. Mm. All right. OK. Mm. Now, hang on, watch this. Just how you can change something with a squeeze of lemon juice and a yep. pinch of salt. OK? Lemon yep. in. Now have another Do taste. Do I get another try? Go have another taste. Mmm. Mmm. Bang! Brought it to life, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Lobster in there. Yeah. It just looks great, doesn't it? Does, it does, doesn't it? OK, and in we go. Lovely fresh chives. Yeah. And that is ready now. That looks absolutely spendy on its own. Never mind the souffle. Let's yeah, go. let's go for that. <laughs> go for it. Oh, go right. on. Okay. Go and have a look. How are they looking? You did your best. Oh, man. You did your best. Oh, man.
Look at those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, and what Ready? are we going to do? Yep. Oh, we're just going to open... Oh, look at that. <laughs> now. <laughs> Ready? Oh, it's worked well. Come on, Paul. I, I shouldn't have doubted you. I really shouldn't have doubted you. Oh, my... I've fallen in love with Souffle again. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, yes. Yeah. You, you first. No, no, come no, on, no, no. You, you first. You sure. first. Let's not argue about it. Let's eat it. <laughs> I'm going to have that bit of... Mmm. Mmm. It's beautifully light. Mmm. And you've got all the richness... The lobster. And you, you get the parmesan. It, it's a complete <laughs> souffle triumph. You have to wonder how Prince William's version of this classic French dish turned out. As well as souffles, the French are well known for their cheese. But in Britain, we produce more different kinds even than the French. Over 700 named varieties, and many of them are royal favourites. Royal warrant holders Charles Martel and Sons have been making cheese from their own old Gloucester cattle for 45 years. Despite having no formal training in cheese making, today Charles supplies his varieties to six continents, 32 countries, and one member of the royal family. He began making a cheese called Stinking Bishop in 1994 and has supplied Prince Charles at Highgrove for around 15 years. Started, I received a, a phone call. Would I make the cheese? Well, of course, I didn't say no, did I? And uh, oh, it was wonderful. Uh, so we've been making it ever since. We received a royal warrant 10 years ago this year. Um, in fact, in recognition of that, we decided we're going to make a, a royal delivery by horse and cart in this vehicle. It's a little celebration for us, really. It's purely self-indulgent. Uh, but I hope it puts a smile on people's faces as we pass through the town. The Prince of Wales was so taken with the cheese that he had Charles and his team make a new version with milk from the Highgrove herd. His Royal Highness wanted to enter it in the British Cheese Awards. Well, we'd already entered. Uh, can't have two cheeses the same name, the same competition. To get around the rules, Prince Charles named his cheese Starville Royal. And what do you know? He was victorious. He won the prize, and I, from memory, I think I got a congratulation off him. And, I, and my response was, well, sir, I wouldn't have expected to do anything less for you. Otherwise, I might lose my head. Charles started the company not because of a love of cheese, but out of concern that the old Gloucester cows were an endangered breed and needed help to survive. So at that time, there were just 68 of these cattle left in the world, and I managed to get hold of three and a bull, very important, and I milked them and, of course, made cheese because that's what you do with them. They're not to, just to look at. If you keep them as pets, you're going to lose them, basically. And you need to give them a job of work so other people can milk them. And there are, there are now six of us making single Gloucester cheese from their milk. And that's a protected product. It can only be made in Gloucestershire on farms that have Gloucester cows. As a local to the area, Charles' passion for conservation didn't stop at saving the cows. He wanted to help the pear trees, too. Perry, made from the pears, coats the cheese and it's this that bestows its distinctive smell and taste. I started replanting the peri pears I was so concerned about in 1977, and that's been fun. But to link it to the cheese, you know, it's it sort of, everything comes together eventually. The cheese's name comes from the variety of peri pear called Stinking Bishop. It's a full, fat, pasteurized cow's milk cheese made with vegetarian rennet. As with any cheese, the first step is to separate the curds and whey. See how slowly it goes? You can see the whey appearing, and the more they cut, the more whey escapes. I would say 90% of this milk by weight is whey and goes to feed pigs. 10% is what we actually make into cheese. The curds are then pressed into cheese moulds and left to set in a cool room for four hours before being washed with perry. Just dip it in and that's all we do. And that, that will cause special bacteria to grow, which is very smelly. And then we'll put a piece of wood round. The reason for that is the cheese becomes very soft and it will travel a great distance. So 
putting the wood on just holds it up together and, and stops it collapsing, basically. The cheese is then left for six to eight weeks to mature in a room that has a consistent temperature and humidity. This is the hopefully the finished product. You can see it's nice and sort of a pinky brown. That's the bacteria that gives the flavour and also the tremendous smell. I'm just going to check this cheese is up to standard. Let's um, take a, a core out. It's quite elastic, a bit shiny. Basically, I can see it's exactly as we want it. And uh, the flavour is... Yep, that's good. That is good. Wow, yes, I like that. And, of course, the characteristic smell, it has that whether we like it or not. Some like it, some hate it. Reputedly, the Prince Charles uh, is tolerant of the smell, so that's uh, good for us. You can almost smell the cheese from here, can't you? What are you up to, Paul? So we are doing a wonderful roasted lamb rump smoked in hay with creamed cucumber. <laughs> Oh. Now, this is your take, a yes. version, a version of, of a very special dish that yeah. was served to Muzaffar al-Din, the Shah of Persia, when he yeah. was Edward VII's guest on the royal yacht in Portsmouth Harbour in the early 1900s. Right, OK. Your take on it. My take on it, yeah. Now, what cut of meat have you got there? This is the rump, mm. OK? So, right juicy. Near the, juicy, right near the back end, obviously. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing, we're just seasoning it, OK? Mm -hmm. We've rubbed some oil on it. We've then scored it, OK? Yep. Let's the seasoning in lets the flavour in and especially the smoking. Mm. I've got some hay. This is feeding okay. hay. <laughs> Not... I thought your salad was a bit dry. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'll tell you what. I don't know what's happened to this rocket, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got feeding hay here, not bedding hay. Make sure you get the feeding hay. The bedding's very dusty. Yeah. Okay, so this has been washed, all right? Yeah. Rumps straight on. Now, I've only put uh, a nibble Fat side in down? It. Fat side down straight away, because what we want to do is start rendering that fat, all yeah. right? Yeah. What that means is, is basically the heat's going to come up and just melt the fat, all oh, right? Oh, and the flames have started leaping up already. Absolutely. Though. Actually, okay. it's rather a, 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 a bit of a, a, a Levantine dish, isn't it? The Shah's yeah. coming from Persia, now Iran, of course. But this is the sort of thing they eat there, isn't it? Yeah. That, that combination of lamb and cucumber. So we're just going to let those roast off, OK? And get a nice caramelisation <laughs> happening on there. Now, over here, we're going to move to our creamed cucumber. Mm -hmm. So we've got some white onion, which yep. we've just sliced. Take our cucumber, like so, go. all right? And just some nice thin <laughs> slices. I never tire of watching a good chef. Or you do this. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Let me tell you about the Shah because he made a, he made a... <laughs> keep laughing. Yeah. He made quite an impression when he arrived in Portsmouth. Went through the went through the streets because he had this socking great diamond in his hat. Yeah. The largest pink diamond in the world, 183 carats, and it made a terrific impression on the crowds who yeah. turned out to see him going for his lamb. Right. Do you know they've lost yeah. it? Biggest diamond in the world, nobody knows where it is. So, okay, what next? Right, okay. Sugar. Mm -hmm. All right. Sugar? Yeah. Nice pinch of salt. Mm -hmm. What we're doing here, we're just trying to get as much of that moisture out of the cucumber and out of the onion, okay? Mm -hmm. So we intensify the flavour, but we also just kind of break them down just slightly. So just fold that round like so, okay? and put that to one side, OK? Yep. So we're just going to leave that for one hour, and what we'll find is all the water will go to the bottom, we're going to pour that off. Yeah. In the meantime, we're going to come back to our hay, all yeah. right? So our lamb has been beautifully roasting, yeah. OK? You're going like to turn that? We've got that nice yeah. roasted lamb like that. Look at that nice bar marking of the lamb. So now we get our hay. So we've soaked that hay, and the yeah. reason we soak it is so it doesn't ignite. It's not just dry Although hay, it's going to go in flame. Go whoosh. OK, put that over those coals. Yeah. And what that's going to do it's going to start smouldering. And you'll see. Can you see us starting to get the smoke? Yeah. All right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. See what I mean. Put that in there like so. Does it so. really make much difference Put, to the taste? Wait till you see. Now we're just going to let that smoke, OK, and let that cook. OK. So we just basically squeeze out as much of that liquid as we can. Now, if you just see how soft they've gone. Yeah. And that's just from the salt and sugar. But they've still got a nice little bit of crunch to them. Mm -hmm. So over here, sour cream, all right? Nice dollop. Sour cream of on the top. Of course, a shah in his country would have had yoghurt rather than sour cream, Yeah, he? definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. 
So over here, I'm just going to add some mint. So we're just literally, Michael, take a nice, Always sharp mint with knife. Lamb, eh? But the flavours really work. Now, I'm just going to let it back with a little touch, just a little touch of vinegar. OK? Yeah. So you've got the vinegar, the sugar, the salt, the lovely sour cream all working together. And now you can see where that comes from, creamed cucumber. Yeah. Right? You'd think the Shah would have been really pleased with all this, but apparently he left the dinner in a real huff. Why is that? Well, he had wanted and thought he was going to get the Order of the Garter. Right. But apparently King Edward decided he shouldn't have it because it shouldn't be given to somebody who wasn't a Christian. So instead, King Edward gave him a jewelled picture of himself. Right. That? OK. That's, yeah. you know, I thought only yeah. celebrity chefs were that conceited. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're far more needy. <laughs> Come on, what? Right, are you ready? Yep. Way. So now you can see that wonderful smokiness happening. God. Just come over. Like something out of Doctor Who, this. It is, it? isn't it? So that over like so, OK? Oh, you can smell the hay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And how long Next. do you think it, it, you need to cook that? For me, nice, because that's the temperatures come down, you're smoking gently, 20, 25 minutes, OK? okay. Until you get to this. Oh. All right? Oh. Now, if you turn those over, mm -hmm. all this cooking juice is mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm. Just touch like that, OK? What are you looking for when you poke it, though? Just with your kind of like, just so it just it gives. It's not you're not kind of it's not soft. No. You kind of it's got that little bit of give, and then it comes back up yep. to you. All right. So we'll take our lamb rump like that. Okay. First of all, we get our lovely cucumber. Nice in the middle like that. Yeah. Okay, like so. Over here, I've got some beautiful salsa verde. The reason it goes so well with lamb is because you've got mint. Parsley, basil, all mm. go well with lamb. Mm. Capers, shallot, mm. gherkins, and some chopped anchovy. OK, we're going to carve our lamb straight in. Now, how thick a cut are you doing? Oh, Just like that. Say, now, like that. that is what you're looking for. You see how you've got that pinkness? Now, we're just yep. going to turn it over, put that onto the plate. Wow. OK, now, remember, we need to get seasoning on this. All the time, thinking about seasoning, going through the plate like so. Mm -hmm. Another slice. And then you've got that lovely oil. It's just... Have a smell. Gosh, it's really right. powerful, isn't it? It is, OK? Sharp then just a little powerful. bit on top of the lamb like that. Yeah. that looks and there good. you have hay smoked lamb rump, cream cucumber and salsa verde. Do you know, I'd rather have that than the order of the garter. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, let's have a go at it. Right, ready? Yep. Here we are, knife and fork. Get stuck no, in, No, you first. You first. You did it. I'm going to have a bit of this bit. It just... It has everything. Wait till you, That lamb just melts. I'm interested to see and that, whether you, the hay really comes across. I honestly think you are going to love this. Mm. Isn't it? Mm. It just all goes together. The smokiness mm. of the hay, that freshness of the cucumber, because the lamb's quite rich with mm. the fat. The shah was in a huff, but I'm in heaven. <laughs> he wouldn't have been in a huff if I was there. <laughs> A succulent, smoky dish, sure to impress even the grumpiest of guests. The Shah eventually got his garter, an honour originally bestowed to knights returning from the Crusades. Military ceremony is a big part of royal life, and Princes William and Harry have both served in the armed forces. Sandhurst chef Rob Kennedy knows what it's like to cater for a royal visitor. Rob is no stranger to having to create impressive meals for high-profile visitors, including crowned heads of Britain and other nations. And when one of the officer cadets is grandson of the Queen, even a more modest occasion can turn into a royal banquet. For 15 years I've been at Sandhurst, and to be an exec chef here, you have to be passionate, you have to be loyal, and I've had the opportunity to cook for the royal family five times whilst being here at Sandhurst. In November 2005, Rob cooked a lavish dinner for Prince Harry and his fellow cadets at the halfway stage of their officer training course. We're in New College dining room at the moment where we feed the inters and the senior cadets. And actually on the dinner night, Prince Harry would have sat here with Charles and Camilla. So this is where it would all have happened. Harry went on to graduate from the Royal Military Academy in April 2006 as second lieutenant, and two years later was promoted to first lieutenant. 
So I'm going to be cooking Prince Harry's guest dinner and it's going to be Suffolk chicken stuffed with wild mushrooms. The first stage is to make a mousse from a pre-prepared chicken breast. And we're now going to make it creamy just by adding a little splash of cream. The chicken mousse is then popped in the fridge to chill for 15 minutes before Rob can add the mushrooms. Prince Charles and Camilla attended Prince Harry's dinner. And here I have the actual company dinner night from that event. And if you actually open the menu, you can see there, supreme of chicken. Parisian potatoes makes it sound even posher. It's opportunity for the officer cadets, you know, to, to invite their family members and have a fantastic evening together. To prepare the mushrooms, we're just going to take just a small handful. So we've got the lovely Giroles and some portobellos and on this fab tray of ingredients, just some curly parsley. And this is just to add a little bit of colour so it's not too beige. It's got some lovely green colours going through it as well. We're actually going to add some butter to this to make it really rich as well. Some set powder onto the mushrooms and parsley. It brings the whole dish together. Give that a fold in. The mushrooms are cooled before being added to the mousse mix. It can then be piped into a chicken breast. And this little bit of skin here just kind of tucks itself over. And that's ready now to pop into a frying pan. The pan is seasoned with garlic and thyme before the chicken breast is sealed. Just a little bit more oil. Get that nice colour on the chicken is what you want. Now it's ready to go in the oven for 12 minutes at 180 degrees. Timings have to be exact, and Rob understands the pressures of cooking for the royals. Everything from start to finish has to be correct and to perfection. You realise what an honour it is to have, you know, food in front of you that you, that you love to cook, but more importantly, who you're serving for. You know, it's great for, it's great for any chef's um, journey, um, and it's definitely been great for me. So we've got some carrots and some parsnips, just roasted natural. Again, some fresh thyme from the academy grounds, a little tiny bit of garlic. It's not even cooked yet, but it looks delicious to eat. So we need to give that, again, in the oven, around about 15 minutes. We need something else that's sticky. That's our marble potatoes. Now, this is a favourite across the whole of the military since I've been in the business. And they're little balls of potatoes that I roast in toasted sesame oil and then finish with sticky marmite glaze. They do say you love it or hate it, but with this one, you definitely love it. And for each dish, we usually do about 10 potatoes. It's not me that has to do this particular job for 300 people. Uh, that's known as pulling rank. So we've got here some toasted sesame oil. You just pop a little bit into the pan and then you pop your potato straight in. Let's add some butter and a nice spoonful of our yeast extract. If you look at that, absolutely delicious. We'll pop these into an oven just for 10 minutes. Just enough time to cook the gravy before it's ready to serve. When I cook, I, I like to cook from the heart. I'm a very passionate person. And, you know, it's a great honour to, to cook for all the royals. What do you think it's like for a professional chef cooking for the royal family? Something like that. It's going to be hugely intimidating. You're going to want to get it right. I mean, our job is quite high pressured as it is. Sometimes the royals live like the rest of us, don't they? Go out for yeah. dinner the way that we would. I think yeah. uh, in 2016, the Queen and Prince Philip dropped in at a very old pub in, in Edinburgh called the Sheep Heed in Dudding... The, uh, in uh, Dudding uh, the uh, Sheep Heed. <laughs> the Sheep Heed <laughs> yeah. uh, in, uh, in Duddingston. Yeah. I mean, the interesting thing is that particular pub, the Sheep Heed, Mary Queen of Scots was supposed to go there occasionally yeah. in yeah. the 16th century. So extraordinary that 400 years later, yeah. a reigning monarch and her husband should go. The yeah. way they travel around changed quite a bit, though, hasn't it? I mean, uh, the Royal Yacht Britannia. That yeah. was decommissioned in, yeah. in 1997. And now some of the royals go on commercial airlines rather than the, the royal flight. Right. 
Do they have to wait for their luggage at the carousel like we do? <laughs> Somehow I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that hasn't changed is the Royal Train, which is still in use after more than 150 years, since Queen Victoria became the first monarch to travel by train in 1842. Dr Annie Gray went to York to find out more. On the 13th of June, 1842, history was made when the young Queen Victoria climbed aboard a train and set off in style. The locomotive was called Phlegathon, the driver Daniel Gooch, and the engineer was none other than Isambard Kingdom Brunel himself. The Queen had been persuaded to try train travel by her husband, Prince Albert, a champion of new technology and a man who was well used to travelling by train. That first journey was from Slough to London Paddington, and it took 25 minutes. But it proved to be the first of many, because the Queen was bitten by the train travelling bug, and thereafter they went all over the place, from Osborne to Balmoral and everywhere in between. The National Railway Museum in York is home to six royal carriages, including Victoria's. We've been given privileged access to them, and it's all aboard with curator Anthony Cools. This is just incredible. It's fabulous, isn't it? This... I do, I'm almost speechless. Tell me, where are we exactly? We are standing in the day saloon of Queen Victoria's carriage built for her by the London North Western Railway in the late 1860s. This deep, beautiful blue and the gold, the royal crests on there, you get a real sense of a, a queen at home mm, here. Mm. There's nowhere to eat on here. I know when she travelled on the continent, she did eat on board the train on, on dining cars, but it was a bit different in England, wasn't it? She chose not to dine on the railway, on the move, unless there were really exceptional circumstances. But she did stop, didn't she, at the station hotel? She did, Several yeah. times. Yeah, and to make sure that the way was clear, they actually sent another locomotive in front called the pilot engine, which had a special code of lamps on the front of the engine that said to the signalman and the station people, the next train through is the royal train and all the trains around it are halted. The museum is also home to a coach built for Edward VII. Victoria's heir was renowned for his infidelities, gambling, partying and eating to excess. He loved his food so much, he was nicknamed Tum Tum. Well, this is completely different, isn't it? It's lighter, it's airier, it's wider. It feels much more masculine as well, it with the does. smoking room. That's and... very much so, with the dark wood in there. That You can imagine the train parked up for the night somewhere and... Smoke uh, everywhere and that's people it, kind yes, of yes. coming out of it going, goodness me. Port and cards. By this yes. point in time, dining cars had come in, hadn't they? It had dining cars for the royal party, then it had kitchen cars. And what kind of thing do they eat? I mean, I know they ate quail because there's an incident where one of them ends up in Queen Alexandra's <laughs> hair. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a bit one of those career-limiting uh, actions, really, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, but apart from the quail, um, what kind of things did they eat? You're looking at anything from a cold collation to a full roast dinner. And when you consider that it's being created at 60, 70 miles an hour, in something not much bigger than a couple of phone boxes glued together, and it's on the move, swaying all over the place. You know, it's nothing short of a miracle that each ma meal made it to the plate and not to the lap. Edward's carriage was used by the royals all the way up until the 1930s. But in 1939, with the outbreak of World War II, it was time to ditch wooden carriages in favour of something safer. In 1941, George VI's new train came with the latest in homeland security. Oh, this is completely different. It is so different to what went before. It's armour-plated, the body panels, it's twi twin-skinned, it's got sealed windows, it's got air conditioning. And George was a man who, like so many monarchs, actually, had a reputation for quite liking plain food. Yes, yeah. Um, he's reputed to have picked up a taste for marmalade, isn't he, from the train? And then asked for it thereafter. Yeah. For, for, not like forever, but... No. Yeah. Thin-cut marmalade. Thin-cut marmalade, marmalade that's worse. right. Why would you want thin-cut <laughs> marmalade? Very insipid, but yeah. there we are, if it's good enough for the king. I feel really privileged to have been able to come inside these coaches and see them. I've been here many times and peered through the windows looking inside, but you really do get a sense of the personality, I think, of the monarchs behind do, them when you're yes. standing in them and knowing that George VI was involved here with the decor and that you really feel that the personalities of the monarchs themselves are stamped on the coaches and I do think it's just there's something really rather magical about it. It's where they stood, it's where they ate, it's where they lived, where they slept 
and you are walking in history. You can always taste the toast, can't you? <laughs> With the marmalade. Yes. Before trains, it must have taken such a long time to get around. Paul, the dish you're going to do is a dish that one of our kings found when he was travelling around the country in a coach drawn by horses. What was it? Portland pudding. Named after the Portland Arms in Dorset. Right, OK. And King George III was a regular visitor, and every time he went to this particular pub, hotel, inn, yeah. whatever, yeah. he'd have this pudding. What it is, is a steamed sponge pudding yeah. loaded with orange. So straight away, we're going to go into the pan here, Michael, yeah. and we're going to make a caramel. Rather a nice story about Portland pudding and George III. George III was the one they called Mad King George. Yeah. Because from 1788, he had bouts of what they thought was bad madness, but we now right. think is a disorder called porphyria. Right. But anyway, they thought salt water would be good for him, and they sent him down to Weymouth. There's a note in a wonderful old magazine called The Penny Magazine, written after George had died, in fact, and saying George III, during his visits to Weymouth, had several times made a tour of the Isle of Portland, and on those occasions he made the Portland Arms his headquarters and used to finish his day by dining at the house. The then landlady had a recipe for making a certain famous Portland pudding and the king never failed to order the pudding in honor of the island what do you think oh, of that fantastic yeah. isn't that brilliant now we keep moving it okay because that is very very hot at yeah. the moment that's about 150 degrees wow okay so and it will carry on cooking so pull it off the heat yeah okay and now we add in our butter fit in at a time yeah and what we're making here michael we want to go away from the heat it's butterscotch it's there, yeah butterscotch exactly yeah. okay so we keep in adding our butter. This like is so. rich stuff, isn't it? Very, very rich. Back on the heat. So you see now our butter's just basically emulsified all the way into this sauce. Already smells incredible. Mm, mm, mm. Next, orange juice. Yep. Turn our heat back up. Yeah. So we get in the orange juice. Really sizzled in there, right. didn't it? Gosh, that's hot. Now again, off. Don't you wave that thing okay. at me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Now we're gonna cool it down with our cream. There you go. So now we go back on the heat. Yeah. OK. And now we're going to get some lovely flavour in there, OK, yep. from these beautiful oranges. By zesting, we're releasing the oils of the orange right on the outside. Absolutely tons of flavour in these skins. And we just want the outside. We don't want to go yeah, right down. Yeah, you don't want to go through to the pith. Very bitter. So we just pull off the heat. You can smell the butter mm. and the orange and yep, the sugar. Yep. OK, like that, we're going to pour in our Grand Marnier. Just like that. So we're just burning, burning the alcohol <laughs> off like so. A shame, a shame, but shame. there you go. <laughs> flame so flame. is this Suzette, as in crepe Suzette? Exactly. Crepe Suzette was invented by accident for Edward VII. Actually, he was Prince of Wales then. And you know, he liked a lot of gambling and all the rest of it. And he's in the Café de Paris yes. in Monte Carlo yeah. with a group of friends. And they're having this wonderful dessert. Uh, a chef called Charpentier, who was a pupil of Escoffier, he comes in with the orange sauce. And it accidentally, the whole thing goes up in flames. Right. And everybody's completely shocked. But then when they taste it, they think, oh, well, that's really, that's really that's rather nice. That's actually quite nice. And, yeah. and, and, the, and, and Edward was asked, what should its name be? And actually, one of his guests at the table was a little girl who was eight years old who was called Suzette. Right. And he said, we'll call it Crepe Suzette. And that's where the and name And that's what it's from. been ever since. Yeah. And that's what we're having, not the crepe, but the sort of sauce, Suzette. Now, what are you doing right. here? Right. So what I've got in this bowl yep. is uh, butter and sugar, yep. which I'm just creaming together like so. Yep. I'm just going to add a pinch of salt. All right. Plain flour. Now we're going to add a little splash of milk. It just loosens the mix so we can start to make the batter. Yeah. I think there's something nice about doing it by hand. Four eggs in. Yep. OK. And now we continue to fold this in. So, before we add in our last final ingredients to our lovely cake batter, we're just going to get this saucepan on, which has just got some water in the bottom and yeah. a plate, and that's going to steam our pudding. OK. Yeah. Citrus candied peel. Can right. I try some? Yeah, go for it. It's like little mm, boiled sweets. Yeah. Yeah, but mm. okay. no, it's got that goes more, in there like that. more concentrated flavour than that. More zest. So there's just that lovely orange all the way through. 
Right. Oh, you got. Uh, now right. we're going to go back to our sauce, mm -hmm. and what we're going to do. So almost a bit like a creme caramel. And now okay? this is the bowl that you've you've lined with Absolutely. butter. Literally just butter it round the outside. That's yep. all. Now we take our cake batter, mm -hmm. move our bowl over to here, and like so, just gently, don't splash the mix up, OK? So you're rolling it out rolling over the sauce. Out, absolutely, over the sauce. And what will happen as well, it will come up the sides and just be mm. absolutely delicious all over, lovely and glazed, OK? Get all of that lovely cake batter You're not going to waste any, are you? No. If you could give me a hand here, yep. I've got tin foil, parchment, Butter, because that sponge is going to rise right up. OK. OK? You're going to put then that on the top? Over the top, and then right the way around, because we want to hold that heat in. Yeah. But also, as well, can you see we've got a pleat in the middle? Oh, yeah, you've got to okay. kind of fold over. So it's an old, old technique, and the reason you do that is because as that pudding rises, mm. it won't tear. It's you, got a bit of expansion Expansion, yep. exactly. Yep. So if you get our string, like so, Nice and tight on it. If you could just give me a hand yeah, what in can holding I do? it, like yeah. so, just holding it. There we it, go. Okay? That's it. Absolutely. Thank you very much. No problem. And then we just. I'm indispensable, really. Oh, good. I, could... <laughs> I don't know how you manage in that <laughs> restaurant <laughs> kitchen without, <laughs> without me. Without you. Know. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There we go. Right. So now we've got our steaming water. Yeah. Okay. Just be very, very careful. Okay. Okay. And then very gently. Oh, mind your hands. Lower in your pan. Yeah. Watch your hands on the side of the pan. Lower it in. Okay. Lid back on yep. and steam for an hour and a half. Luckily, we don't need to wait an hour and a half. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We have got one we've done earlier. Take our string off from mm -hmm. the outside, like this. It's exciting, this bit, isn't it? Look at that. Oh, yeah. Now, just with a knife, just yep. go round the edge, just so nothing's caught, OK? Plate on, yep. OK? One, two, <laughs> three. Over. Like so. Down on the table. Yep. All right. Now, and then again, just a little kind of belt, just a little belt and braces, all right? Yep. Just round the top. And abracadabra? Abra yeah. <laughs> no. oh, yes, abracadabra as well, all right? <laughs> and hopefully. You had me worried for a minute then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, very, very nice. Now, with some very, of that very lovely, nice. beautiful sauce. You're going to put it over the top or around the side? Absolutely. No, no, we're going to go straight over the top. And don't be shy. Lots of Do it. Do not be shy. Lots of it, OK, because it will just soak into that sponge. I can smell oh, the orange. So. It's, oh, it's fabulous. Mm. You can just imagine George III sitting in the Portland Arms with his Portland pudding that he'd probably been looking forward to for weeks. Just hope I did him proud. <laughs> You're going to just tuck into it? Go for it. Straight in. No plates. Oh, look at the way. I'll just get some of the sauce. Come on, just how on. moist that is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you see how that sauce glaze is, like, baked in all mm. to the side and caramelised it? All that different kind of orange mm. hitting it at the same time. And that sponge is just oh. incredible. It's brilliant. You oh. can see what he liked about it. You know, they called him Mad King George. But I tell you what, he knew a thing or two about puddings. He certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Join us next time for more Royal Recipes.